When reality hits this market, and I think it's going to hit in March, April time frame, it's going to be ugly and brutal. I don't even think the Fed can bail us out this time. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for February 5th through February 12th, 2024, while supplies last. This week we have Silver Valcambi or Asahi 100-ounce bars at just $1.39 over spot per ounce. We also feature pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 Liberties at $89 over melt and $139 over melt, respectively. Next, backdated one-ounce silver maples are at $3.75 over spot with a minimum order of 50. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this returning guest. Michael Pento is an active money manager. He's the founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. He joins us now this Thursday, February 8th, 2024. Michael, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Uh, We have a lot to talk about. It's great to be on with you again. There have been a lot of things happening in the financial markets, in particular in geopolitics and uh, debt and deficits and all kinds of things, banking uh, strains, etc. One of the things that we're noticing is a dramatic pullback in uh, retail investment activity in gold and silver. And that usually correlates to people having a sense of uh, ease or comfort with the uh, main financial situation, whether it's the banks or the markets. It, correspondingly to that, over the past three to four months, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has notched almost 5,000 points gain, which is about a uh, it's a very significant gain from 32,000 something to 38,000 something. And uh, people are thinking, well, it looks like we're back off to the races again. Uh, my financial advisor was correct. Just buy and buy on the dips and hold and stay invested in the nice 60-40 stock bond portfolio and all will be well. And you have been bringing us a different perspective that gives us some other thoughts that maybe people should be having as they're listening to this sort of standardized advice from average retail uh, investment advisors and watching the flagship uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, So can you dispel some of the misconceptions that may be swirling around these uh, statistics that people are watching and thinking that all is well, and perhaps they should be uh, looking at a layer deeper into what's going on in our financial world? Well, yeah, I hope I can. So, um, first of all, let's look at let's look at some. I like to live in reality and truth, Donegan. So, I don't when I look at the stock market, I don't look at thirty Dow Jones stocks. So, there's a lot more stocks than just those thirty stocks. So, let's look at the Russell two thousand. Two thousand stocks, mostly small cap stocks, but two thousand stocks. That index is down twenty percent since the end of two thousand twenty one. Twenty percent. Okay, let's look at the S&P 500. The S&P 500, 500 stocks, that index is up slightly since 2000, the end of 2021. But the equal weight index, the RSP, which has all of the AI stocks in there, is down 4% and is unchanged this year. If you look at the bond markets, I'm, I'm a fiduciary and I run portfolios. So you have to have, you know, no one has a stock mark, a portfolio of stocks that are 100% AI stocks. I, you know, that that would, you know, throw you out of the business. You get sued and you'd be, you know, fired uh, given any any duration. Um, so uh, the equal weight S&P 500, as I said, has gone absolutely nowhere, nowhere, nowhere this year is down 4%. So it's just a handful. There's seven AI stocks, and that's getting more and more narrow. Now it's like just five of them that are working. This is one of the most narrow market rallies in history. And going back through history, not only in this country, but around the world, anytime you have a stock market that is going higher, you just quoted the Dow Jones uh, 30 stocks. There's a handful of hands, of stocks in the, in the S&P 500. When it's that narrow, it always, not sometimes, it has always ended in disaster. So if you look at 40%, the the treasury market is down 40% since the end of 2021. TLT, long duration U.S. bonds, down 40%. Russell 2000 down 10%, equal weight down 4%. So if you have a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds and not just AI stocks, you've had a very challenging two years. That's, That's the truth. So let's just start there. 
This is not some runaway bull market that is leaving everything but gold behind. That's not the case. The standard advice that people have gotten for the last 40 years or so from most retail investment advisors is to just buy and hold uh, and stay in in that balanced portfolio. We've talked with you about that several times in the past and why that advice may have actually worked fairly well over the last four decades in a regime of falling interest rates. And what will the next five, 10 years look like uh, in contrast to that based on the changed environment? Well, you know, buying and holding a balanced portfolio has always worked through time. It's been very prudent to do that. But when both stocks and bonds are in a bubble, like they were at the start of 2022, then it's very dangerous. Because you could, you know, normally the bonds will act as a ballast to the equity portion of your of your portfolio. That didn't work. If you own stocks and bonds, since I, since the end of 2021, you've gotten destroyed. Just just a broad basket of stocks and bonds destroyed. So it it no it no longer works when both are in a bubble. And I I got to tell you this. This is some research that I, they just pulled up recently. If you look at the Chinese market. And I'm going to I'm going to say this. Let me just let me just put the rubric around this. What I'm going to say is that when you buy bubbles, when you get sucked into bubbles, you can get destroyed for not years. Sometimes you can get, get destroyed for decades. So the Chinese stock market, the Shanghai exchange peaked in 2007. It, that, that exchange is down 53 percent in 2024 from 2007, that, that bubble high. The Japanese stock market, the Nikkei Dow, peaked in 1989. That index is still below where it was. 35 years later, their bubble, 89. The U.S. stock market is in a massive bubble. Most stocks have already retreated. They're already starting to crumble. It's just that just that, that uh, facade of a few AI related tech stocks that are keeping this ruse afloat. But it's not uncommon around the world and even the United States to see years and decades go by where you have to wait to get back to your high water mark. So I, I am I am not a bear in the stock market. I run money for clients. I am net long with hedges. I've been so for about, you know, a year and a half now, maybe two years. So I'm net long, but I'm I'm assiduously and astutely focused on the high frequency components of my model to let me know when reality is going to hit. And when it hits, it's going to hit hard. And I think it could last for years or decades, just like we had in, you know, 1929 to 1954, the S&P 500 didn't hit a new high. There were six years went by in 2007 that we didn't see a new high. So you could see um, an, another, you know, lost decade for stocks like they had in, this, in the 70s. It wouldn't surprise me at all. So, I, I, listen, am I long? Yes. Am I cautious? Absolutely. I'm on guard. I'm vigilant. So I know when to make that change. Because Dunnigan, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a this this market, the economy, the mainstream financial media. This is why I come on programs like this because, you know, you. I, let me give you an example. I bet you heard from the mainstream financial media that this latest non-farm payroll report was phenomenal, right? Did you hear how wonderful? Three hundred fifty-three thousand net new jobs. You heard that. Right? You're shaking your you're shaking your head, right? Let, can I just go through some some? Let me just tear that apart a little bit. So I'm going to give you the reality behind that that those those that data that net new jobs were created. I, I want you to guess how many how what's the raw what do you think the raw number before seasonal adjustments? How many jobs were abs, actually created in January? Go. I want you. I'm not. I hate to put people on the spot like this. I hate to do it. But I want you to guess. So the, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is the part was as part of the Department of Labor, said there were 353,000 net new jobs added in January. I want you to tell me what you think the actual raw number was before seasonal adjustments. Of the addition of the increase? Of the increase of uh, the increase. I don't know. 
I'll say 400,000. The raw number was 400,000, you think? The actual raw number was a negative 2.5 million people got fired in January. That's the raw number. Did you hear that from the mainstream financial media? I, I, I bet you didn't. Because seasonal adjustments, people get hired for Christmas, they get fired in January. So they had that. I mean, that's a massive, see, that's a pretty massive seasonal adjustment, right? All right. There's two surveys. There's the establishment survey and there's the household survey. The household, household survey showed that there was a minus 31,000 people employed for January. People lost their jobs in January. Um, 174,000 people left the labor force. Uh, I, 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 I'll go on. The index of aggregate hours worked, which is the actual actual labor impulse into the economy, which in, so includes number of people working times the hours, because you could hire 10 people, but if they all work an hour, I mean, that declined by a whopping three tenths of a percentage point. That's a huge decline in the index of aggregate hours worked. So here's what I'm trying to say. I don't know if it's if they're if it's election engineering, if it's politics. I, I don't know. I'm not that's I'm not smart enough to know that. I will tell you there's a lot of misrepresentation of economic data and of even stock market data. Because people look at the headline S P and they think the market's doing well or the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but underneath that artificial facade of a net 30, 350 353,000 jobs created, the labor market is cracking, it's weakening. And underneath that headline S&P 500 figure, the, the internals of the market are cratering. It's, it's got horrible breath, breath with a D. So um, you know, look, look, I like to live in reality and that's why I like to come on shows like yours because I can express what's actually going on and it's not good. Yeah, we've had uh, John Williams from ShadowStats.com on our show several times tr and explaining to us how not just the labor statistics, but all of the government statistics, whether it's the way that they calculate inflation, the way they calculate GDP, the way they calculate uh, whatever the, the officially acknowledged debt, etc., uh, that basically all of these things are engineered to make things look better in, in general. Uh, and yet... <laughs> For people who are on uh, Social Security or other uh, payments that are supposed to be calculated by that, they feel the pinch because there's where reality, they live in reality too, trying to buy uh, medical care and, and uh, groceries and things like that. And there they see the pinch where the government is telling them that their cost of living only went up by whatever, a couple percent, and they're seeing prices jumping 10, 15 percent uh, annually at their the things that they purchase that they have to live on. Uh, any thoughts from you on some of these other areas outside of labor and, and stocks? Yeah, well, the GDP, you know, the GDP numbers are booming, right? You, you know how they got the GDP number to be booming, right? By multiplying the headline uh, inflation figure by 0.5. That's how they did it. I mean, they, they said that the, the rate of inflation, so the GDP deflator, which is what they use to deflate nominal GDP, cratered from the third quarter to the fourth quarter. That's, that's, how, they got, that's how they got that number. The way I figure out if you use a rational number – to deflate nominal GDP, we had 1.5% GDP growth in Q4. And now, the, and now the Atlanta Fed has GDP growth for Q1 of 2024 at 4%, over 4%. I mean, it, it, it's remarkable. I mean, I think rea when reality hits this market, and I think it's going to hit in March, April timeframe, and, and I want to I go through that with you, why I, why I just picked that month those two months. I think when reality hits this market, it's going to be ugly and brutal. And again, if, if depending on the act, and it might not even depend on what the Fed does. I don't even think the Fed can bail us out this time. Because it, after all, you know, people tell me, well, you know, okay, Michael, um, well, let's do it. Let's just go through the negative impulses for March and April. So come March, and March 11th, the bank term funding program expires. That that is, that is going to expire. Now, all of the assets that were taken from banks in March of 2023 were were distressed. So you have mortgage-backed securities, and you got treasury bonds, commercial mortgage-backed securities. Um, 
all those all those bonds that the Fed bought at par are going back to the banks at an even lower value than they were in March of 2023. And the banks have to give them, the Fed, all of the all that credit back at par, plus interest. And banks are already tightening lending standards aggressively. They're going to have to, you know, they have increased capital requirements. And now they have the distressed assets going back to the banks. Commercial mortgage-backed securities, maybe you've heard of New York Community Bank. New York Community Bank. You know, if you live in New York, you get that jingle in your head. Well, New York Community Bank is the seventh largest mortgage orig originator in the United States. The seventh largest mortgage originator in the United States of America. It's not, small, not some small, cute little, you know, uh, Soho bank, you know, New York Community Bank. No, it's a big bank. These banks are not going to be able. I'm not saying that's going to be a 2008, although it's possible. But these banks are not going to be able to extend credit to the private economy. They're, they're capital constrained and their assets are crumbling. So now also in March, the reverse repo facility runs dry. That's March. End of March, early April is the time frame that I think that the reverse repo facility goes close to 100 to 200 billion, which is. The basically the minimum that, minimum that it's supposed to hold. So the liquidity for the bond market, which is being drained by the QT program, quantitative tightening, is being offset by the money coming, that's sitting fallow at the Fed, comes off the Fed's balance sheet, goes into the economy, then the Fed takes it away with QT. Well, come March, April timeframe, all of QT is going to be draining reserves from the banking system. So that you know that th those two things are extremely negative, uh, a negative liquidity impulse in March and April. So I think that that's when reality could hit the bond market, the repo market, and the stock market, and the banking system itself. If you could talk to us briefly about that, because we definitely saw signs of significant strain in the banking system at the end of Q1 of last year, when we had the failures of the second, third, and fourth largest uh, bank failures in the United States history. And it's been relatively quiet since then, with some minor banks, uh, smaller, failing at a less frequent uh, pace than they were in, in the first quarter a year ago. But uh, what you're describing sounds like it will place uh, renewed increased pressure on many banks, uh, some of which are in terrible financial shape, according to Alistair McLeod, who we interviewed, says there. A lot of these have high gearing because a lot of the rules, the limits were were lifted, just like, just like Congress uh, finally solving the... Uh, the budget deficit uh, uh, standoff by saying, "Okay, fine. There's no limit on. There's no, no no longer a debt ceiling cap anymore for the time being." And similarly, that seemed like the the regulators removed the uh, the reg on the reserve banking system uh, re their equity requirements uh, back in the in the pit of the depression. Can you talk to us about the strain on the banking system? So. Um First of all, so you, so I I called I incorrectly called for a recession in 2023 because I understood the fact that these banks were going to be under a lot of pressure. Well, you know, was you, were you wrong about a recession? Yeah, you know, technically, yeah, you were, but I wasn't wrong about where we were headed. The direction of the banking system was in meltdown mode in March. Well, let let's just not forget the bank term funding program, which now is about one point. I think it's one point, uh, uh, yeah, a hundred and sixty billion dollars. Last time I checked, a hundred and sixty billion dollars of distressed assets are piling up on the bank term funding program, which ends on March 11. This particular program printed four hundred billion dollars. Print the, the program, the Fed, because of this program, printed four hundred billion dollars in two weeks to bail out the entire regional banking system. United States. That is why we didn't have a recession. And so I, you know, obviously I didn't know that the Fed was going to do that. They did it. And I changed my strategy and my opinion about the, the problems we would face in 23. But that's what they did. Now that program's going away. And I just, I just explained to you how bad it's going to be for banks, because let's just say we have, for example, there's $1.5 trillion of commercial real estate loans that are going to come due in the next two years. These loans are 40% underwater now. So there's, you can't tell me, uh, you, you, can, you can make an argument that Michael Weld is not going to be 2008. 
But don't tell me that there's not going to be any stress in the banking system and that these regional banks, which are responsible for 30 percent of all, all of their assets, 30 percent of all assets, their commercial mortgage backed securities and, and mortgage backed securities, 30 percent. They're not going to be able to make any loans anywhere near the extent that they have been in the past. And we have a debt based fiat currency system. And when you make a loan, you create more money. You cre- that's how you create money. And how you cre- and when you create money to make a loan for the purchase of capital goods, that's how you grow. You know, you grow the economy that way. It's the productive side of the economy. That's that's going to be com- completely impaired. Um, it's already impaired. It's going to get a lot more so come March and April. I'd like to talk to, and we haven't talked to it here, is about the real estate uh, way that that evidences itself. When you talked about the productive side of the economy, one of the things that happens in times of artificially suppressed interest rates is distortion of asset allocations. We're seeing, we live in a, in a, a county in central Florida that's considered to be the fifth fastest growing county in the country and the fastest growing county in the state. We are surrounded, even though we're not near a major metro, we're surrounded by real estate developments. There are tens of thousands of new homes and apartments being built all within say a 30 mile radius of where we live and uh there's a wonder there are a lot of people moving to florida i'll give you that but there's also wonder is is this overbuilding and are we going to end up with what happened in china with these cities standing empty that were built because the government just had to had to keep this activity going to keep their population employed or whatever their their other motivations were other than that there was actual demand for that real estate what do you see as far as the supply of real estate that's being built out during this epic period of low interest rates versus uh, the actual ability of people to afford these places going forward and what that stands uh, as far as real estate values and that sort of thing going forward. What's your outlook in real estate? Well, first of all, you have to understand that the home price to income ratio is at an all time record high. It's it's about 5.5 times. So the median home price is about 5.5 5.5 times more than the median family income. That the previous peak in the global financial crisis right before that was five. So we had an all-time record high, and buying a home now is 50% more expensive than just being a renter. And prior to the global financial crisis, it was 33% more expensive. Okay, so we have a, we have. A situation where you have 20 to 25 percent of all homeowners are investors. That's just tremendous amount of supply, tremendous amount of supply that can come on the market. Once I see the labor market crack, I think the whole facade of a housing, you know, a stable housing market crumbles. Um, and uh, You'll see a lot of supply coming on the market when that occurs. I want to mention that um, when you include so home ownership, if you include taxes and insurance, ate up forty six percent of the median median U.S. household income. It's a record high. That figure, the the pre COVID figure for that was twenty nine percent. So you know, there's there's a a lot of potential energy here to be unleashed in the housing market. Uh, it's never been more expensive to own a house relative to rents, re- relative to incomes. Um, and although the underwriting standards are better now than they were in 2008, the extent of overvaluation is worse today than it was in 2008. And so you could add mortgage-backed securities to the CMBS securities that are held by these regional banks and bigger banks too. And it all points to one thing. Are we headed to 2008, another 2008? I think it's, I think it's highly likely. Um, what does the Fed do in response to that? Do they just simply lower interest rates back to zero? Maybe. Do they go back into QE? Maybe. Do they launch another, you know, TARP, TALF, um, helicopter version of helicopter money? Maybe. But here's the big difference. Every other time in history since 1987 that the Fed went down that road, 
they did it many times. They did it in the, you know, the Thai bot collapse, Russia, Russia collapse, 2000 NASDAQ collapse, 2008, 2019 repo crisis, 2020 COVID. I mean, they've done it over and over again. Every time they've done it, there was a condition of deflation. They were fighting deflation. And when you, the way you, the deflation, by the way, done again, is a healing process. It is, so recessions and deflation are a way to heal the economy from the excesses. You know, it's creative destruction, sort of, in a, in a way, a version of it from Joseph Trumpeter talked about it, uh, famous economist. Um, so the next time the Fed does this, the next time the Fed goes back into QE mode and ZERP and QE and helicopter money, I have a very salient fear and belief that that relief that usually comes from lower interest rates, I mean, the Fed controls the short end of the yield curve. That There's no doubt about that. So they can always take interest rates to zero. T-bills, T-bills will go to zero. Fed funds rate will go to zero. But the long end of the bond market, which is concerned about supply and inflation, might not respond favorably. In other words, prices could go down and yields could go up because you're not fooling anybody anymore. The, the, the value of a currency is uh, the faith in a fiat currency is what inflation is all about. And people lost their faith in the U.S. dollar's purchasing power, not against the euro, not against the yen or the pound or the yen. They lost faith in purchasing power against, of, against hard assets, against, you know, edifices. So that happens again. The Fed goes down that same path. I think any relief that is normally found from lower interest rates, which is part of the deflation story, which is part of the, you know, debt default and reconciliation story, goes away because you could get rising long-term bond yields. And so, so, so this there's no quick salve, if that's the case. So that's my caveat, and I'm watching it carefully. For people who may be waiting on hold to see which direction the real estate market uh, turns before they decide whether to uh, stick their neck out and, and take on additional obligation of, a, of buying a new home or whatever. And some, frankly, are have been priced out of the market with the recent rate increases over the last year and a half. Um, the response of mortgage interest rates to the phenomenon that you're describing of the Fed trying to drive down short-term interest rates, but perhaps the market not following and, and leaving long-term interest rates high, does that imply that mortgages, which are typically fairly long-term, 30 or so years, um, would are likely not to come down? That's my whole, that is my whole point, Donnie. And my, whole, my whole point is that um, LIBOR, now so far, and the 10-year benchmark yield might not retreat as it's done every other time in the past. So that's part of the healing. Like again, I said, okay, so home prices fell in 2009, 2010 by 33% by the time it was all over. Healing process, bringing, you know, bringing asset prices back to a level that can be supported by the free market. Uh, the cost of money fell. 10-year note fell from 6% down to 3%. Uh, in this last COVID outbreak and uh, when the Fed took interest rates to zero, the 10-year note bottomed at 0.5%. <laughs> so, but that's good. That, that's a way of healing. That's how they heal the economy. It's, you know, it's artificial, the way the Fed does it, but it would happen anyway if, if, you, if you let the market forces work. What happens if they intervene again and the long, long end of the yield curve doesn't respond well? I mean, right, right now... According to the National Association of Realtors, 23% of houses in the U.S. are affordable. They have their definitions of affordable. A year ago, it was 50% of homes in the United States were affordable. It's a pretty significant drop in the number of homes that are affordable. According to Michael Pento, no. According to Pento Portfolio Strategies, no. According to the NAR, they, they put out this data. It's unaffordable to the average family income. Unaffordable. Uh, so the healing process is natural. I mean, the healing process would be very normal. Deflation, asset bubbles pop, that would help bring down rates down and it would help bring down prices. If the Fed allows that to happen, great. 
I have my doubts though. I, I have my doubts that they'll allow the market to work because we have such an excess in this country and in, not only this country, around the world, such an excess of asset bubbles and debt levels. We didn't even talk about the, the debt in this country. You know, we have, if you look at total non-financial debt as a percentage of GDP, not in nominal terms, because nominal terms is, oh, it's, it's, you know, to the thermosphere. Not, I, I'm looking at it in terms as, a, as an economist, as a percentage of the economy. We've got more total non-financial debt now as a percentage of GDP than we did prior to the global financial crisis. That's a fact. So, um, you know, there's a lot of artificial things that need to be corrected and reconciled. And that's the only way you're going to get a sustainable and healthy economy is you, if you allow that to happen. And I have my doubts. Another phenomenon, uh, you talked about the dramatic drop in uh, what's called affordable housing as so from the National Association of Realtors Survey saying from 50% to 29% just in the past uh, less than two years. This is uh, 23%. <laughs> uh, that's in contrast to what we're also seeing, and I guess this is the ugly side of that when you take it to the extreme, is these uh, homeless camps uh, sprouting up in metros all over the country. And it, it's reminiscent of what were dubbed Hoovervilles back in the Great Depression of the 19, uh, late 1920s and into 1933, et cetera, uh, under President uh, Hoover, where there were tent, tent encampments and villages for people who really couldn't afford to live in a home anymore or had gotten repossessed, uh, dispossessed of their home or their farm or their small businesses or whatever. Uh, since the COVID era, we've seen the shuttering of uh, different uh, estimates are large numbers, millions of small businesses uh, completely driven out of business by the lockdowns, etc. And now we're seeing these homeless camps sprouting up all over. Do you foresee, um, it sounds like you're foreseeing that the, the current real estate market is still evidence of a bubble, meaning it's got to come down to reality at some point. Um, but being completely unaffordable, being a bad time for people who are thinking of taking on additional obligations there, perhaps for people who are landlords of multiple properties right now, they might want to consider lightening their, lightening their exposure there. Um, but as far as the signs of the times and what's, what may be coming, uh, if we have something like 2008 or worse, uh, do you foresee the, the probability or the likelihood of a, uh, more widespread people absolutely unable to afford housing, needing to, needing to uh, come up with more desperate measures for housing? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is yes. I mean, and this is all, this all, all the, the blame I lay at the feet of government here because I mean, what did the government, I mean, the road to hell is paved with good intention. So what does the government do when they have a crisis in the housing market? They buy up all the mortgage-backed securities. They print money devalue the value, you know, the value of the currency and buy mortgage backed securities, taking their rates down, you know, you buy bonds, the price goes up, the, the rate comes down and they create this and they give people money <laughs> to buy houses. They print money and send checks in the mail. Uh, and, and they tell people, you know, the mortgage forbearance, you know, Hey, don't pay your mortgage for, you know, two years. And the prices of the houses go through the roof. And you end up, you know, it sounds good though. I mean, ostensibly you say, I'm doing this so I could keep people in their houses. But the other side of that equation is, the, the other side of that balance sheet is, the, you know, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction in physics. You've created a massive bubble in price and now it's unaffordable. And now you have to pay the piper on that front. So yes, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are gonna be joining those 10 cities. Um, and again, it's it's the fault of the government. They, you know, the market has a way of self self correcting if you just let it happen. It happens gradually. It's not always great, um, but when you when you intervene in markets and artificially inflate them, this is the consequences that you get. And it's and by no means have we seen the end of this. No, you're either going to have, and you're probably going to have both conditions. You're going to have massive deflation and a depression. Or you're going to have, and or you're going to have some form of intractable hyperinflation. There's just it just just the level of debt and the level of asset bubbles that's out there it demands for one of those things to happen. Of course, the good the good thing to happen would be a deflationary recession slash depression to, in a cathartic sense, to to you know reconcile all these imbalances that we have out there. But there's just no you know we live in a very political. Uh, 
uh, you know, environment and which, whatever is politically expedient tends to happen. So, you know, I have no doubt if Powell sees the unemployment rate spike and home prices begin to fall and the stock market begin to crumble, he is going to go back to the same playbook. Hey, let's just go back. I mean, I don't know how fast he gets there. That's the debate we can have. Perhaps, perhaps he's going to be a little more reticent to do it. That's my belief. But on the other side of that, I think you've already broken, you know, you've jumped the shark or crossed the Rubicon. You use the, you know, you use the, the analogy, but um, people, the, the market for our currency, which is what inflation is all about, we, we have crossed the Rubicon on that front. And people no longer believe that the government can put in the place a condition of stable prices. And if they go back to ZERP and QE, there's not going to be anybody who's ever going to have the temerity to come on, even CNBC, and tell you, oh, the Fed's got this. They've got it under control. No. And I, I think prices can go through the roof. And long-term bond yields, given the supply, you know what happens in, you know what happens in recessions, right? You know, <laughs> the automatic stabilizers kick in and the revenue to the government plunges and the debt to GDP skyrockets and deficits go, you know, Deficits are already $2 trillion. They go to four, five, six trillion. And, and who's gonna buy who's gonna buy all that? Uh, well, it's gotta be the central bank, and if the central bank buys it, you can bet inflation is gonna run intractable. And then and then they're, and then they're gonna tell you, oh no, all right, we're gonna we can control inflation. No, you cannot. You cannot control inflation without destroying the economy. You proved that already. Yeah, and in the past several crises, we've seen the principle of uh no good deed goes unpunished, meaning that people who are actually, our businesses or people who are actually acting responsibly did not get bailed out, but those that were being reckless, as you mentioned, whether it's banks or government or whatever, that it got, got bail, bailouts. There was an old uh, country song, I, I need a bailout or something like that. But anyway, the in this next go round, for people who do want to act responsibly now to protect themselves from the carnage that may be coming, uh, what options are remain available to them if bonds are no longer a proper counterbalance to stocks in a portfolio, et cetera? Uh, right now, we're positioned in the short end of the yield curve, not the shortest end, because I think, I, I believe by second quarter of this year, we're going to start to see the economic data, especially from private sources, really scream of recession. That's going to be very beneficial to the you know short end of the yield curve. It could even be slightly beneficial to the long end of the yield curve in a short period, you know, in a truncated time frame. Um, so that's where I'm investing. Uh, I have uh, I have depicted several short positions that I'm going to take on in the portfolio when that my indicators uh, flash red. Um, you can buy physical gold because that'll be very very beneficial in, in anything but a liquidity crisis. Which is possible, so that you you know you might have gold shoot up uh, temporarily, and then for a very short period of time, if the banks run out of money, a repo crisis in, ensues. Um, you'll have a short period of time where gold corrects, but then it's off to the races after that. Once with the Fed, you know, not real interest rates will plunge, in my opinion, um, because just, I mean, even though rates might go higher the rate of inflation will go up much faster than that. So real interest rates would plunge in the next uh, crisis. So those are those are the things I'm looking at as protection for me and investors. And as part of that, you're an active you're an active money manager trying to keep your clients out of out of harm's way as things go sideways. How can people get a hold of you if they want to follow up with you on that, Michael? So the website is pentoport.com. On that website, you'll see something called the midweek reality check where I um, give my thoughts. It's $50 a year after a five-week free trial. Um, and if you have $100,000 to invest and you are a U.S. citizen, I'll directly manage your money in the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle portfolio. That's at pentoport.com. Michael Pento, as always, thank you for joining us on Liberty and Finance. Always my pleasure. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for February 5th through February 12th, 2024, while supplies last. This week we have Silver Valcambi or Asahi 100 ounce bars at just $1.39 over spot per ounce. We also feature pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 liberties, 
at $89 over melt and $139 over melt, respectively. Next, backdated 1-ounce silver maples are at $3.75 over spot with a minimum order of $50. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.